Good evening. I'm Milbury Polk, co-chair of the Explorers Club Annual Polar Film Festival. On behalf of my committee, Stefan Kinberg, Sarah Bookums, and Jeremy Hershorn, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program. Tonight we have three films. The first one is Colder Than Ice, about kayaking in Antarctica. The second film is a Sedna epic expedition about two girls scuba diving off of Baffin Island. The third film, Love is the Way, is about the Arctic um, National Refuge. After the third film, we will be joined by filmmakers Kristen Gates and Jeremy Lazell and special guests from the Gwich'in Nation to answer questions um, live. So stay tuned and stay with us till the end. It's going to be a very special evening. Thank you for joining us. Marcus Waters. I'm the General Manager of Commercial and Partnerships at the Antarctic Heritage Trust. Thank you for taking the time and having the interest to watch my movie Colder Than Ice, which documents the first uh, sea kayak journey in Antarctica. Back in 2001, myself and two Kiwi mates, Graham Charles and Mark Jones, paddled down the length of the Antarctic Peninsula in sea kayaks from the northern end of Hope Bay, past the Antarctic Circle, uh, to a little island called Laird Island, which is just off uh, Adelaide Island. That was 20 years ago, and it still holds the record for the longest sea kayak journey in Antarctica. My work now at the Antarctic Heritage Trust is about inspiring explorers, and we use the legacies and stories from the uh, early Antarctic explorers, from the heroic era of Antarctic exploration, that's Captain Robert Falcon Scott, Ernest Shackleton, um, Carsten Borshamink, and latterly Sir Edmund Hillary's expedition bases and huts in Antarctica as a source of inspiration for, for young people and for the next generation of explorers. So sit back, hopefully you'll enjoy this movie. It's a, it's a little grainy, a little, little coarse, but it's a, it's a rollicking good yarn of some, uh, some good old Kiwi lads going out and having a great adventure in Antarctica. The northern tip of the Antarctic continent is marked by the Antarctic Peninsula, mysterious, beautiful, and unexplored. In this ice-bound world, three adventurers from New Zealand are undertaking an incredible journey, sea kayaking hundreds of miles to the polar circle and beyond. During the expedition, they will paddle along the most isolated coastline on the planet, challenging their skills of survival and endurance in the harsh, unforgiving environment that is Antarctica. The team begins their expedition in Ushuaia, Argentina, a small town on the island of Tierra del Fuego, known as Fan del Mundo, the end of the world. Preparing for the adventure has taken two years, and every item of equipment has been checked and double-checked. Their sea kayaks have been designed and constructed for the extreme demands of kayaking ice. Ushuaia overlooks a natural harbor. To get to the Antarctic Peninsula, they must first cross the notorious Drake Passage to the northern tip known as Hope Bay. The yacht Toluca, captained by Roger Wallace, will be an important part of the expedition. Roger will rendezvous with the kayakers several weeks later at the end of their expedition near the Polar Circle. Ahead of them lies a difficult and dangerous journey. And as Toluca gently rocks in the safety of the harbor, a priest blesses the expedition. The settled weather is a good omen, and they pray it holds for an easy passage across the Drake. Crew member Anna Archibald prepares lunch and conditions remain calm. 
the expedition team enjoyed a relatively leisurely passage. Back home in New Zealand, expedition members Graham Charles, Marcus Waters, and Mark Jones have spent the last 12 months preparing and training for the adventure. The most challenging aspect of our journey will be the long distances where we're exposed to open seas and uh, no chance or no possibility of landing. If we get some nasty weather descend upon us during this first leg of the expedition, then we'll certainly be paddling for our lives. Being in a life-threatening situation is quite a possibility down there. We've got a lot of apprehension. There's a lot of unknown that we're heading into. And I guess that's what makes it the, the great adventure that it is. Mark Jones works as an outdoor instructor and is a senior lecturer in outdoor leadership at the Auckland University of Technology. Graham Charles is an adventure photographer and will record the experiences of the team for a book he plans to write. Marcus Waters is a senior consultant in human resources and his organizational skills have proven to be a valuable resource for the expedition's logistics. Because yeah. all the big tabular bergs that come from over here off the ice shelf yeah, yeah. truck on through here and spit out yeah. there into the Drake. I've searched every sort of reference and book and stuff I can for information on the coastline and there's still only about 10% of my questions answered. The unknown I guess is the, is the biggest fear but it, it's also what makes this a great adventure. You know, it's the fact that nobody's done this before, we don't know whether it's possible. The 700 mile crossing of the Drake goes faster than expected. And as they draw closer to their destination, icebergs and penguins welcome them to the land of ice and snow. After five days at sea, they are excited to reach their goal the Argentinian base of Esperanza in Hope Bay. Okay. Good. Their objective is to complete a world first and paddle to the Antarctic Circle, 500 miles to the south of Hope Bay and located at latitude 66 degrees 32 minutes south. If they succeed, they will enter an Arctic exploration history and will have paddled further south than any previous expedition. We wanted to paddle in Antarctica. We get in it. We got snow. We got cold. Just loading up some food here. At least we don't have to worry about refrigeration. They depart Hope Bay, paddling into a cold gray mist. Ahead lies one of the longest and most difficult sections of the route, a coastline defined by towering cliffs of ice, which offers no shelter from bad weather. A small island off the coast provides a site for their first camp and for their first problem. Their natural water supply has been contaminated. So all the snow around here is all foul because of the penguin colony. And it all smells like rotten fish. So I'm going to try this water that's in the ocean here, which must have come off a glacier. It must be fresh water. It's a bit like fishing. The next morning brings another unexpected problem. Well, I don't know how we're going to get out of here. We, we came in last night just before midnight and this, our little alcove here was uh, fully clear and now it's been choked up with brash ice and there's some huge big bergs and growlers. So, I mean, in essence, we're, we're trapped right at the moment. We're, we're trapped. <laughs> Two 
two days pass before the ice allows them to leave. They struggle through a narrow channel and enter a frozen landscape of fantastic shapes and sounds, as well as a novel navigation issue. Round to your left, Jonesy. Round to your left, I think. There's a way through. It's quite fun when you when you do get some stuff that's just kind of thick enough to get through, but you have to work as a team where you do it kind of like a cycle race where someone will be in front and so they're putting in a lot more work just, just crashing through the ice and then they do that for a few minutes and then they just pull aside, someone else would go by. Every day got more and more dramatic, and every day the Antarctic just seemed to keep bringing it on. I love sea kayaking for the places that it takes me, not for the mindless stroke after stroke. But I love the, the scenery and the wildlife and the adventures that it takes me into. I think the experience is a much more profound one when you visit wild places in a simple way. The scenery is just stunning. The mountains are just rising straight out of the, the sea. Big steep walls and bluffs. Big glaciers cascading off the side of these mountains. Some large snow fields. I'd heard about massive ice cliff collapses into bays and, and equipment, boats and dinghies and stuff being washed away by these tidal waves that wash out of, from a big ice fall. We always had the impression it was like paddling past a, a sleeping giant. You know, at any moment it could just flick us off the face of the map. Go. One of the remarkable things was watching these icebergs move like a ship, smashing their way into these waves, driven by the currents underneath them. Like alien monsters, gargantuan icebergs growl and roar, rising and falling in the southern ocean swell. On the big open water crossings between islands or across the mouths of bays, the fear's got a long time to gnaw away at you. We never talk about it, but you see it in each other. People's nervous glances over their shoulders at the clouds, or looking inland to the ice cliffs and where the catabatics come from. Catabatic wind is a pressure-driven wind which blows from the Antarctic continent out to low pressure areas off the coast. They can blow anything from um, 15, 20 miles an hour through to a, a shrieking blizzard over 100 miles an hour, and then they may blow for days. You had a lot of time to worry about what might happen. After a long day, they approach the coast to make camp. The wind has thrown up a turbulent sea, and a large wave catches Marcus as he comes into land. Graham and Jonesy watch helplessly as he struggles to avoid being overturned and swept onto the rocks. I thought, oh no, what, what am I going to do here? So I, I quickly tried to sweep the nose of the boat round because if I'm facing into them, then I can punch through them. And uh, my heart was in my mouth there for a few minutes as I, as I saw a couple of these waves come in. One of them caught me side on and then I managed to get my nose round and, and then pull the nose of the boat over the 
over this foaming wave that was coming barging down on me. My boat could have easily got smashed up on the rocks, smashed to pieces. Uh, I could have got knocked out. I could have got seriously hurt by being carried up on the rocks here. So that was a real close call. If he'd gone in on that wave, then that would have been the end of his boat for sure. It would have been the end of the trip. I thought it was all over there for a while. Disaster averted, the team takes time to appreciate their stunning surroundings. Pay an awful lot of money to see that, really. Just gets better and better, doesn't it? There's just no ordinary days in Antarctica. Aside from the incredible landscapes, the team experiences other sensory delights. Why am I eating my dinner with your sock hanging up Oh, face? come on. Yours were hanging up there last night. Yeah, but you weren't eating your dinner. And, well, at least mine don't stink. <laughs> Smells to me like they stink. <laughs> Sometimes get, you know, the ice cream headache. It's definitely kind of a, a one dip wonder. Like the explorers that have come before, the team is drawn to Antarctica not simply to conquer, but to witness firsthand this magical and hostile land. Each day, they have no idea how far they must paddle before they are able to find a beach or landing point where they can make camp. Certainly, this expedition has been a great adventure so far. The most adventurous aspect is not knowing where the hell we're going to land every night, not knowing if we're going to land. Um, we have very scant information about the coastline, there's not much you can discern from the maps. And so we put in some very long days. 14 hours was one day before we could find a landing. The Antarctic is certainly not a place you want to take for granted or certainly not a place you want to come without respect. A storm is developing, and they seek shelter in a bay once used by whalers in a bygone age. A beached whaling ship slowly decays into history, a ghostly relic from an era of slaughter and waste in the delicate Antarctic environment. of the whales once hunted to extinction in this Eden, a lonely fleet of wooden boats once used by the whalers decompose on a nearby beach, a subtle reminder of just how alone they truly are. Yo. Turn there. Beautiful. What a cool place, eh? They continue paddling south towards the Antarctic Circle, a constant refrain of dip and stroke. You say you're going to do something, you invest so much energy into it, and then I always worry that maybe our planning is, wasn't enough or for some reason will come undone. The constant repetition begins to wear on Jonesy's body. I was very sore, so my back was even worse, but we just 
carried on paddling. But Marcus was intent on keeping paddling and I didn't want to be the cause of us stopping so I bit my tongue and just carried on paddling. Paddled for about 20 miles and got to Cape Mouscott and I was quite keen to stop at that stage. When I was training I had injuries that were always a concern and I, I didn't know how they'd go down here with doing the long distances and a really heavy boat and I was I was really sore and I was quite apprehensive as to whether I was going to be a cause of the expedition floundering because I just couldn't keep up the miles. The massage from Marcus reduces the pain and provides Jonesy with enough relief to continue. Wildlife is prolific and shows no fear of man. It has been many years since hunters worked in this region, and seals, whales, penguins, and seabirds thrive in the pristine environment. They stop to enjoy an encounter with a group of playful Weddell seals. Later, they meet a leopard seal. This species is known to be more aggressive than the Weddell and is large enough to capsize a kayak and its occupant into the freezing sea. The first real dramatic event was when we were camping on Whittle Peninsula and we'd found this a reasonably large beach area to camp on where um, a slip had come down and, and deposited a lot of gravel into the sea. We were able to get up onto that after a long day and we camped and everything was good. And we got out and, and saw that we are actually surrounded by these towering ice cliffs. Um, it was really quite an amphitheatre of, of ice cliffs and there were these huge blocks perched up there. It was just this kind of cascading glacier that was lobbing off these big ice blocks. And throughout the day we'd seen a number of different avalanches, blocks of ice come piling off down into the sea. When ice lands in deep water, because it can't form a wave right then, but the wave in its, in its hidden form travels out until it hits kind of a benched area where it can rear up as a wave, just, just like on any coastal area. Marcus and Jonesy were over by the beach closer to the edge of the bay. And I, I grabbed my camera and thought, well, it seems to be the action was hotting up a little bit. And then I thought, well, perhaps it's the time. Perhaps it's gonna, something's gonna happen soon. So I started walking over with my camera. Oh, 
Holy moly, that is enormous. As I stood there and watched, I suddenly realized that there was in fact this, this huge wave coming towards our campsite. And it came rushing up the beach and, and pounded over the head wall. <laughs> Jonesy was running up the beach, I was running in another direction, and this wave came sweeping across the, the beach. About here I lost my gumboot, my foot sank in the ground, my, my um, boot came off, I kept on going. Because so I looked back and the wave was just cresting the wall over here. And I ran up to the high point up here, just in time to look around and see the wave sweep my boot up behind me, which I grabbed out of the wave before the wave receded. And, and it was a very close thing. God. So, oh. My boot is soaked and it got washed up behind me <laughs> by this bloody wave. Oh god. I was, I was watching I was watching Marcus. Saturated. I was watching Marcus. And I was just thinking, oh mate, should I keep shooting photos or am I gonna run and grab the radio and get out the hell out of here? If these guys are washed away, at least I can call somebody, you know. Oh, oh mate, gee, it was. Washed over Filling here. Filling with bread. Well, if we camped over there, we would have been screwed. The tent would have got washed away. We would have been fully in trouble. <laughs> I'm really glad we didn't camp there. As they draw closer to the Antarctic Circle, it is becoming colder and paddling is becoming more difficult in a slushy sea of brash ice. The brash ice punishes both muscles and kayaks, and they are grateful for the kayaks' reinforced Kevlar hulls. All the careful planning and preparation has paid off, but some things cannot be planned for. In these extreme conditions, damage to the kayaks is inevitable. In our haste to drag Marcus's boat up, when we landed, we um, broke his rudder, caught on something, and got bent sideways and quite badly damaged. So we spent a while straightening that out, using a cleft in the rocks as a like a vice. We suddenly realised that Jones had actually split a seam on his boat, which means that he was taking on water. Oh, split. So that needed some repair. That's not good news. No, that's definitely split there. Split, so where does it go from? Split right along to here. Probably a good foot, a foot and a half. Right. Still need to tape this Could be a job to... for Dr. Duct Tape. Luckily, before we left New Zealand, Marcus insisted that we bring a fiberglass repair kit. So we we're easily able to get that done and get moving again. We hadn't gone very far across the bay and we heard our first spout. And then we heard another spout and another. And before we'd gone very far, we realised that the whole bay was full of humpback whales. Is that a seafarer's thing of getting wind going? <laughs> like that? What about kissing it? Oh, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Get us. Sail us home, baby. Nice, nice Graham pleads for wind, and it works. There's an old mariner saying, below the roaring 40s, there is no law. Below the 50s, there is no God. This is the Southern Ocean, 
the loneliest place on Earth, and the team is about to experience its raw power firsthand. Passage stuff, we just lying around on the flat calm deck about two hours ago, cursing the no wind and wondering how on earth we could possibly anywhere, be anywhere near the Drake Passage and have no wind and now we've got probably a, a slight gale outside. You never sit down when you're up there because a big wave comes along and it goes straight up your leg, down into your boot and then you stand up and it goes up the leg, through the knickers and down into the other boot. <laughs> Sort of yeah, of course, I'll need to come around about 302. Yeah. Wind strength is increasing, and an unspoken uneasiness comes over all those sword. aboard Toluca. Even though the galley stove can roll with the storm, no one feels very hungry. Oh, it sounds like there's uh, lots of action up on deck, but um, you can't have too many people running up there, running around up there, and uh, especially dangerous at the moment because um, if somebody fell overboard, it'd be very serious. It seems that we'd only just sort of started to master the the gale when uh, one of the sails ripped and tore right where a baton had been lost uh, a few days beforehand, which uh, left us no recourse other than to turn the engine on and motor for a while just to keep the boat even into the wind. Overnight, they motor slowly into the waves. The wind dies, yet the morning brings new problems. The main engine on the yacht is the mainsail. And so when that ripped, it's kind of like, oh my God, this is just going to take even longer. We were forced to use a trisail, which is a much smaller little sail, which instantly meant the rate that we were able to move through the water was, was reduced, meaning it was just going to take us longer to get back to Ushuaia. We'd sailed through polar storms and gales. We'd torn the mainsail in the storm. We were down to our last 10 gallons of water. Roger was even rationing the last roll of the toilet paper. It seemed like there was nothing, nothing else that could possibly go wrong. We just saw Cape Horn this morning. We thought all our problems had almost come to an end and we were going to get into some calmer water and um, we were going to be back in Ishwa in another probably 48 hours or so, but um, lo and behold, just as I was sitting down below listening to the Walkman, the, um, the bearing went on the, the gearbox and the, the engine down there, which means we can't use the engine, which means we're now technically adrift until Roger patches up the sail. We never really know when the next thing's going to pop up, and when it does, we uh, we Back to our we bunks. Go back to our bunks and have to deal with it. <laughs> and that's uh, that's the way things have, the way things are. Things could be worse. I'm just waiting for an outbreak of plague or something <laughs> else. But to... <laughs> everybody else can go wrong. Around Cape Horn, the infamous wind returns. It was ironic. We had about a 40 knot breeze blowing out of the Beagle Channel, and unfortunately, it was right on our nose. We were laughing on the, the trials and tribulations that we've been through as we crossed the Drake Passage. And, and at one point Jones actually said, oh, the worst thing that could happen now is that we actually go aground. And we all laughed, you know, oh, 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 of course, oh, no problem. Jonesy! Jonesy! Drop the mainsail, will you? And Roger suddenly yells out, we're going to go aground. 
my god, we're gonna go aground. I've never been aground before on a boat, so I just didn't know what to expect. I didn't know whether it was gonna hit the hit the beach and then just flop over on its side and I'm I'm going, what do I do? Do I jump overboard? Do I kind of, you know, just start swimming? And I'm looking at Roger and he's flustered but he's still relatively calm and, and so we 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 bounce along the, this beach and, and here we are, grounded. Okay, go ahead. Station sailing for Luca, this is 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 Luca, uh, affirmative, yes, yes, affirmative. We were preparing the, the Zodiac to get some people ashore or to try and get a rope out and try and pull the boat around while we were bouncing up and down on the bottom. Other people were preparing some gear to go ashore. Uh, just talking to Chilean Navy, um, they start to um, ask questions about, you know, were we aground, was this an emergency, and um, there may be cost involved in, in pulling us off, which is okay, but um, <laughs> the ultimate irony, they've just come back and said we're actually on Argentine territory, which means they can't uh, affect a rescue, even though they're like a couple of miles up the Beagle Channel here, um, we'd have to get some Argentine boat to come and help us. Frustrated, the team exhausts all means to dislodge the Toluca. A Argentine tugboat turned up and offered us a tow, which we gladly accepted. Um, yes, we have an Argentinian vessel uh, just off our side here. Uh, I'm not sure what the situation is at the moment, over. An Argentinian Navy vessel comes to the rescue and a line is quickly secured to the stricken yacht. Disaster averted, the crew quickly makes Toluca shipshape and ready to continue on to Ushuaia. A relieved Roger and Anna are especially happy to be floating again. So once again, spirits seemed high for a, sh for a short period until we started back into the sailing business again. By this time we're down to uh, probably our last two gallons of water. Toilets were no longer working on the boat, so all amenities were over the side. And uh, we still weren't sure if we were ever gonna make our final destination. With Ushuaia only a few miles in the distance, Tuluca receives a much needed tow. Looking back over the last week or so of sailing, it seems like everything was uh, as it shouldn't have been. So we just simply loaded the kayaks in the water, bid Roger and Anna farewell, and then we paddled for home. The objective of the, of the expedition to the Antarctic Peninsula, we believe in that travel in delicate wilderness areas need not be destructive and that it can be sustainable. Suddenly there were, the, there were just dozens of family and friends and well-wishers there at the airport and 
waving cards and stuff, and it was, it was really neat. Roger's going, oh shit, we're gonna go Graham! <laughs> So we, so we get to a flyer and no, we're all going, what do we do? Yeah, we've got to get back to Shwa the next I'm day. I'm more aware of, of just taking a bit of time out for people that are important for you. Kind of a bit more zen about life. I remember that evening there was an absolute stunning sunset. We climbed up high up the ridge to look south and view the next part of the coastline. And I remember just sitting up there and just looking out south and thinking how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing. And just what a magic journey it had been. It's more about uh, knowing yourself and deciding just to make that little bit of extra effort to uh, get to know the world around you and learn to understand the bigger picture. In Nunavut, when I look at the sea and the ice or the water and I look out, um, I think of home. I am Alexia Galloway Alenka. I'm 20 years old from Iqaluit Nunavut. I'm Kristen Angangai Khamnaq. I grew up in Nunavut for my whole life and I'm living in Ottawa for school. The other day I did my first ocean slash polar dive um, right off of Jalluhu Island, Devon Island. Um, and it was amazing. It got, we got to go down um, among some sea ice and I saw some kaniuk, some sculpins. Yeah, you could see where the rocks ended, you could see the sand, you could see all the kelp. At one point we looked up and we could see some ice right above us. I've never been under it, so that was um, probably one of the highlights of that dive for me. Just to be surrounded by ice, like from Nunavut, like my home territory, um, not many people from here get to say that they've done that. And I guess 
even experienced divers around the world can't say that it was overall just quite an experience. Let's say I was a young girl and I saw Inuit women doing diving, I would be interested and want to learn from them. I want more young women to be um, open to uh, adventuring and getting out of uh, any of their comfort zones. I think in that sense it will be inspiring for young women. It's empowering because you have to trust yourself and you have to know what you're doing when you're diving. This overall journey has really taught me more about myself um, and, and my own limits, even in, in, in things that I want to do and things I want to learn and when, when I want to challenge myself. I'm thankful to have had this opportunity Thank you for tuning in this evening to watch our film, Love is the Way. This 45 minute film showcases the powerful voices of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Those people who wish to protect this sacred place for future generations. Included are leaders from various indigenous communities, top scientists, advocacy organizations, and artists such as the famed wildlife conservation photographer, Michio Hoshino. The backbone of the story is told through a Vietnam era U.S. Air Force veteran, pilot Don Ross, who in his post-war years piloted hundreds of expeditions into the Arctic refuge and can speak firsthand to this unique environment's incredible ability to heal individuals like himself from devastating wartime experiences. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge teaches us to confront hard truths and acknowledge past injustices. Ultimately, we learn from an indigenized worldview with the hope of ensuring indigenous people's rights and the rights of Mother Earth. In fitting with the core values of the Explorers Club, whereby we promote the scientific exploration of land, sea, air, and space by supporting research and education in the physical, natural, and biological sciences, we are proud to share with you a brief glimpse into the importance of our planet's Arctic world. We hope you'll stick around for this evening's Q&A. A lot has happened since we first premiered this advocacy project six months ago. We're very lucky to have leaders and experts joining the conversation. These include the true stewards of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from the Gwich'in and Inupiat communities, along with the film's producers from the Northern Alaska Environmental Center, who will further discuss many of the current issues surrounding the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you to the Explorers Club for putting together another great Polar Film Festival. And thank you to everyone out there for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoy the film. I guess I was attracted to flying and enthralled with airplanes from an early age. I'm not sure why exactly. Maybe I was a pilot in another lifetime, who knows. But uh, that was the case, and as I grew older, then, gee, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> it's kind of an ego trip uh, for some. The forward air controller makes his search for the seemingly invisible enemy. Spotting his quarry, he marks the area for fighter aircraft to follow through. When I ended up going to Vietnam, and participated in the destruction that was rained down. I guess I didn't assess all of the implications of that, which means as a person who flies those kind of airplanes, you end up going to war and having to kill people. Farther north, vapor trails mark the paths of bombers that continue the daily bombardment of enemy installations, bridges, and underground tunnel complexes. Sorry, I get pretty emotional about some of these things because I've seen it. We've inflicted wars on people out of our own ignorance. And still people are dying. It's madness. It's 
all I can say. And if it needs to end, we can end it. We've got the will, some of us. Anyway. From that experience and the, the trauma of it, which wasn't as nearly as severe as, as some who were on the ground, I was impelled to become an activist for peace and, and reason. After the military, I was a professional pilot, and you could say that that was my master's degree. From that time forward, I was blessed to be able to fly airplanes in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and then later as a private air taxi operator. I've spent years flying, canoeing, and exploring Arctic Alaska, and speaking with those who live here and studied this landscape. I feel compelled to do all I can to protect the Arctic refuge before it's too late. I was inspired to call myself Peace Rider by a woman who called herself Peace Pilgrim. She walked across America for many years. As I rode my bicycle from Fairbanks to Washington, D.C., her simple message became mine. Overcome evil with good, hatred with love, and falsehood with truth. I left in winter to dramatize the urgency for action on climate change. Years later, that urgency heightened by delay and inaction, and it remains. And so this mm, effort now is, is much the same as that, to try and stop some of the destructive practices that we've engaged in, not only wars, but plundering the environment for profit and to what good end destroys things that are of, of sacred value to some and, and to some who never visit there, just the knowing of it is important. And so it's wars and environmental destruction are part of the madness that we've been inflicted with. And when Ultimately, more of us move to a, a higher level of consciousness and come from that heart place, I think. Those kinds of things will come to an end, naturally. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge lies in the northeast corner of Alaska. A masterpiece like the Great Plains of Africa, the Serengeti. The refuge is public land and protects some of the last Arctic coastal plain in Alaska that has not been damaged by oil exploration and infrastructure. It is crucial winter denning habitat for endangered polar bears. It is also critical calving habitat for the roughly 200,000 caribou and porcupine caribou herd. For millennia they have returned year after year on the longest mammalian migration on Earth give birth on this coastal plain. This is why its Gwich'in name translates to the sacred place where life begins. I had the occasion to spend many hours in the air, largely in the summertime, flying over the refuge. Some in the winter doing surveys for polar bears, and then later on, much more frequently than I ever did with the Fish and Wildlife Service 
taking backpackers and floaters into the refuge. In the course of that flying, I saw the changes and the destruction of land and the impacts from oil development on the land. Flying in the Arctic refuge for more than two decades, I came to regard it as a sacred place like many others. I began to experience a deep healing that was necessary after my war experiences. And it was a place I found reconnection with the earth and with the spirit of the place and the creator. It was like flying in a pastel a piece of artwork. For the many years that I flew in the refuge, Ichio Hoshino was a dear friend whom I was privileged to work with. He became, in later years, well known in Japan for his photography as well as his writing. Recently, I was graciously gifted footage from one of our trips together on the coastal plain. It was this gift that ultimately inspired me and others to make this film advocating for continued protection of the Arctic Refuge. Ichio was one of those gifted people who had the talent to capture not only the incredible beauty of a place, but its spirit as well. And it was through his expert photography and writing, as has the writing and photography of many others, that has inspired so many to fight for the protection of the Arctic Refuge. Uh, あの、ツンドラに咲くいろんな花を食べるわけだけども、その中でも一番好きなのがこのケブカショウガモという花で、え、たくさんこういう花が咲いてるけれども、この花が。すごいな。どこら辺まで続いてるかね。The Trump administration is waging war on our public lands, and now is the time to stop much of the BS that's gone on. It has happened repeatedly in our history. The rights of indigenous people have been ignored and trampled on by Western culture, and future generations denied the legacy of their sacred inheritance. But now our collective survival on the planet depends on not repeating mistakes of the past, and while the situation may indeed appear hopeless, public pressure endlessly applied, as I have heard, can usher in a new era. And that gives me hope. Listen to the heartfelt words of indigenous leaders, Western scientists, as well as activists and storytellers who have come together to say, no more, not here. And you know, included that nobody even talks about is Anwar in Alaska one of the great sites of energy in the world. And I didn't think it was a big deal. And then one day, a friend of mine who's in the oil business called, is it true that you have Anwar in the bill? I said, I don't know, who cares? What is, what is that? What does that mean? They said, no, is it true? I said, what does it mean? What's the big deal? And they did put it in. They said, well, you know, Reagan tried. Every single president tried. And not one president was successful in getting it. The Bushes won. Everybody. I said, you got to be kidding. I love it now. And after that, we fought like hell to get Anwar. He talked me into it. Oh, 
Jack Whitson, Eastleigh. My name is Bernadette Dementif and I'm from Fort Yukon, Alaska. Founded in 1988, the Gwich'in Steering Committee is the unified voice of the Gwich'in Nation of Alaska and Canada, speaking out to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Coastal Plain. But to us, it's called Ejik Gwatsun Gondai Godlit, the sacred place where life begins. Our people gathered at the first gathering in over 150 years in Arctic Village, and they gave us their direction to go out and tell the world that we are here to do it in a good way and do not compromise our position. But by the direction of our elders, we continue to stand strong in unity with the strength of our ancestors. In 2017, Trump's administration opened our sacred land to oil and gas development. Our elders directed us to continue to lead this fight, to continue to protect our land. Our identity is not up for negotiation. As parents, it is our responsibility to protect our children, and that is to adjust climate change. We need to do better. As Indigenous people, our identity is interconnected to our land, to our water, and to our animals. If there is damage to the land, then that's damage to us. We have to recognize that, and we have to do better. We have to stick our differences aside and come together as Indigenous people and protect our homelands. Woo. I see Tom! Well, in many ways, my heart's still in that place, even though I flew there for more than two decades. Um, and in the end, I came to regard it much as you do from a different perspective, but also regarding it as a sacred place because it touched my heart because of the beauty and of the people who lived there and depended on the animals. So while you and I are talking about uh, people, it's also, we also speak for the voiceless many. I always say I don't only use my voice for the Gwich'in, I use it for the caribou, I use it for the polar bears, for all the birds that migrate up there. But I'm here now to share my responsibility as a, as a Gwich'in. And as Gwich'in people, our responsibility is to protect the porcupine caribou herd, to protect their calving grounds. If there was no porcupine caribou herd, there would be no Gwich'in. Our creation story tells us that we are one of the same. A piece of their heart lies within my heart, and a piece of mine lies within theirs. The Gwich'in and the caribou share a heart. I mean, when it comes to the last place on the North Slope that hasn't been developed, that hasn't been affected by oil development from what I've seen, and we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation if we weren't gonna lose it if oil development happens. You know, as indigenous people, we're raised to respect all things. That's our water, our land, trees, our animals. And that's just the difference is that we understand the beauty and the value of it. That's what's gonna sustain us. That's our survival. We don't only feel attacked by the government, we feel attacked by climate change at the same time. And that's very stressful on our people. It's just all interconnected. Our identity as Gwich'in, our food, our survival, our mental health, it's all interconnected, it's our land. To us, it's called Ejikwatsan Gondai Godlit, the sacred place where life begins. Our elected leadership, they just say, oh yeah, climate change is real, and they leave it at that. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to have our own Arctic Indigenous Climate Summit, um, where we gathered in Fort Yukon and discussed a lot of the um, changes that we are all witnessing. People misinterpret it as the end of the world. It's a time, we prophesy this time of when our people come back together again, that it will be a time of change that feels like the end of the world. The world will be changing. As much as I speak out against the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, these are my illas, my relatives. And when the last piece of muck duck that we're able to harvest is gone, and when that caribou, we start seeing more black bone marrow happen, when we start seeing our fish get sick, my illas are gonna be just as devastated. And that's what I, I hope when I talk to them, they understand that we share that connection 
and we're both we're all going to lose if we start to drill in the Arctic refuge if we continue to desecrate our lands and so that's that's some of this time that we're living in is this time of change and this time of our peoples coming back together again because we recognize our relatives up here as our, as our relatives from long ago but if we continue to go down the path that we know is not right in our hearts we're going to see changes that are irreversible and that's what pushes me and so i hope that um, we as indigenous peoples continue to see that continue to recognize each other in that kinship in that relationship with each other and realize how strong we are together we didn't just survive we thrived for thousands and thousands and thousands of years without this money without this oil and we can do it again and we will do it again and i want to say koyanak for everyone that showed up here to to protect our sacred lands I mean, I understand we can't stop climate change, but we can stop adding to it. We're human beings first, and we have to hold ourselves accountable as well as others. We're going to continue to hold the oil and gas companies accountable, hold the um, congressional leaders accountable, and um, continue to work in a good way. At the time I was in Vietnam, which was 1970, I was uh, in the Air Force and like many people at that time, we believed what our government was telling us, that we had a reason to be there to defeat the enemy. And we were talking about the evolution of consciousness. Well, personally, I wasn't in that, in that place where I could appreciate energetically what was going on. So it's been a process of learning and changing my mind about a variety of things, but the way the war shaped me, uh, that particular war, but some of my later experiences in other places where there were ongoing revolutions was, uh, I guess, to appreciate uh, the folly of killing ourselves to begin with because everything is connected energetically when we're taking the life of someone else, we're essentially harming ourselves. There's this psychological trauma that, that goes with all of that, the killing and taking of life of others against their will. Yes, the words that come to me about, you know, to try and guide people along a different path. And it speaks to that reason why we're here, I think. And some of us have more, more role in that than others, but nonetheless, I think we can all function in that way. I also feel really adamant and strongly about um, our capacity as human beings to shift the dynamics of what's happening right now which is not just an ignoring of indigenous rights. It's just a blatant outright attack on our mother earth. It is the colonial, the colonizer mentality um, against an indigenous worldview that recognizes that we need to restore balance to this world and we cannot continue to extract resources as we've been doing. We need a freeze right now on new development until we can sort things out in our nation's capital. Elect people that are really going to act on the most burning issue of our times, which is climate change. But we need to be in the same room and we need to be having real dialogue and conversation and underscoring the fact that we're both human beings and we need clean air and clean water and just face the science of what's happening with climate change. If we can have that foundation, then we don't have to scream and yell at each other, but we can have a dialogue about, okay, like, how are we gonna do this? How are we going to move forward and have this just transition off of fossil fuels that it absolutely has to happen? And, you know, what are the sacrifices maybe that we have, that we're gonna have to make and within those sacrifices, perhaps there's a coming together that is going to enrich our lives so much more than we could possibly imagine. 
I've always felt that and kind of inherently known in my gut that the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the cabin grounds, were going to come to the forefront in a huge way. But when I look at Mauna Kea and the Amazon and these other places that are just as sacred, I see that it's really indigenous people who have been caretakers of these places whose worldview is so desperately needed right now. I guess you could say it's that fierce love. It's that love of also being a protector. Just as if anyone would come and try to harm anyone in my family, somebody's trying to harm the birthing grounds of the caribou. And that's my family too. So yeah, I mean, I have so much love and also I have a fierce determination to protect that place, like so many people do. スコアっていう鴨の卵だと思うんだけども綺麗に産んであるねもうあと一週間ぐらいでひな飼うかなけどつんどらってこういう風に一回見たその何にも生き物がないように見えるけどもあのこう鏡で人間鏡でじっとした
engage in the activism, you see hope everywhere. If you don't engage in the activism, you think it's hopeless. But once you engage and you tap into the younger generations, you see hope everywhere. And what this refuge could mean for future generations is it's a magnificent piece of art. Respect ke quan tak le nan ni cha sa respect tra ya kun sin ra ha na cha chan ko da tha chan ma si ko hen ya ko ai chi shi ni zi a i na cha chi ni li ta tha chan ke kwa da ni li ta tha chan ni zi a i cha tin chin nai ki he a ken chet ma si kuin thang ai sa chan hit ken chet shik ko an wat zai ti he cha tin chet ta thak chan cha cha ton cha cha ko ram tai ti te ve kuin zi wat sai chan me ke ra thi cha wat sai ke ra tak the thing that run in their blood is just that the uh, economy. They, they don't really care about the uh, going into somebody's land and, and, and scar the land and tear up the land and destroy what what's uh, pretty there, you know, the, the birds and the animal and the fish and, you know, and so on. Once their oil are all gone, you know, they, they, they gonna leave uh, without washing their hands. They gonna leave and then they gonna, they, they gonna leave all that problem to us. People will be very happy the next hundred years. They will be very grateful for Guchen people. So if the land is still the same as today, they will be very happy to go on the land and then they could see, take pictures and fish in the water. You could drink, you could still drink water out of the creek in the next hundred years. Uh, we know that a virtually intact wilderness will be permanently altered, not only by the seismic exploration that's proposed, but by whatever development might occur. There is the myth that uh, only 2,000 acres will be, be affected in all of this, but just the nature of the terrain, more like any oil that's there is in pockets here scattered around the place, that there would be impacts across that tundra plain. This proposed uh, 61,000 kilometers of seismic impacts with a grid at about a 200 meter spacing or 660 feet. That's an incredibly extensive and dense grid across a, a large and beautiful landscape. What makes the Arctic Refuge different and much more sensitive is the difference in topography. So you have the more rugged hilly portion in the western part of the refuge and flatter but still kind of rolling topography uh, over on the eastern portion. Well, the proposition of 61,000 kilometers of trails across a unique and beautiful and wild landscape is a huge concern, both from wilderness concerns to actual long-lasting scars. So there's really great concern that uh, any of those seismic programs that could be undertaken uh, would cause significant damage to the to the surface area and that would essentially destroy it as a wilderness area. So that's one of the significant uh, values of the place and, and what makes it unique is that it's still this virtually intact wilderness area. All the polar bears and of course the porcupine caribou herd calves there and, um, makes it a, a unique place biologically speaking as well. So The plate motion is what's pushing the 
Brook Range forward here, pushing the Brook Range further north, creating these the tallest peaks in, in the U.S. Arctic, creating the glaciers, creating the the lumpy topography, you know, the saddle roaches and the lumpy topography, the 1002 area, which creates a, a unique ecosystem compared to the ecosystems further west. You have a, a different type of tundra, basically, a different type of drainage system, different hydrology. All that creates different types of uh, plant growth, which supports different types of animals, and different you know, numbers, different uh, varieties. And that same crunching of the 1002 area by the Brooks Range, between the Brooks Range and the ocean, that really complicates the geology, the subsurface geology, which complicates any kind of oil extraction you want to do. So to find those efficiently without just poking a bunch of holes in the ground and building a bunch of roads to, to get there, you, you kind of need this 3D um, dense seismic work to really pinpoint and target your best shot at, um, at where the oil reservoirs might be. So the topography is kind of a blessing and curse. It, it creates this really special place, but if you want to develop it, it creates new complications that don't exist elsewhere. It's really hard to develop a strategy or a technique to avoid that kind of damage and persistent long-term impacts. So between that topography, snow cover, ground ice conditions, and still the reliance on these cat trains to facilitate these seismic vehicle operations, it's hard to foresee not leaving a substantial mileage of trails that are permanently damaging and persistent across that beautiful landscape. When it takes 100,000 years or 30,000 years to have something change or it takes a thousand years. When you start shortening the window of change rapidly, you better be very concerned. When you go from a hundred generations to make that change to five or less, then, then you're almost at a rate you can't undo it. And as uh, far as I know, we have one blue planet and uh, we better hope it doesn't turn into one brown one. Once you industrialize, civilize, and yeah, you know, <laughs> civilize um, the, these wilderness areas. Do I think that you should protect a wilderness area to the point where nobody ever gets to see it? Well, no, I don't think that. But I think they need to be protected so that the species within it survives because they are gems. And uh, like, like any gem, it doesn't, it shouldn't be only in a photograph that you go, wow, that would have been cool. Like anything, if you take the wild in the wilderness and throw a harness on it, you don't have the same wild and you don't have the same wilderness. And if we don't save it, there's nowhere else left. We no, can't go and find another area like it. No, as we were speaking earlier, everything else pretty much to the west of the Canning River has been dedicated to industrial use of some sort or another. Not all of it's been impacted, but certainly a significant portion of it. Yeah. And so that this place that we call the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the last of those places. Yeah, I think the call to action for everyone right now is to stand in solidarity with the Gwich'in, but also to stand in yourselves in that reflection of where we want to be going. Do we want to be going into this course of action that is literally an addiction that we have as humanity? Or do we want to take the time and envision a just transition to a different future that is more communal, that is us relying on each other rather than corporate entities. And this is really an encapsulation of that fight and how we can sit in this right now and do that self-reflection and do that self-work and decide where to be on that. But also I think it's really important for people to comment. And what we're trying to do right now under this administration is called energy dominance. But dominance is not regenerative and keeping these spaces intact for the animals and the waters that sustain us is actually what we need to be focusing on, not an obscure notion of energy dominance. I think that 
There are so few places in life in the world today that are that pristine, it's criminal to put it at risk. It really is. I would just think that one of the most beneficial things would be to take the people who are so hell-bent on developing the refuge and send them down the river for 10 days. To actually have them visit there and have at least a little exposure to what it's really like. I remember in the old days when the congressmen would come up to do the fact-finding of the refuge and they'd fly up from Fairbanks, they'd fly around in a big circle, look down at the refuge and then fly over to Pluto Bay for a big dinner. And that was their fact-finding expedition. And I, I think you don't learn a damn thing that way. That the way to, to learn about a place like that is your boots on the ground. the effects of industrial activity on caribou movements, all the way from the Red Dog Mine on, near the Bering Sea coast to uh, Ungava Peninsula in Quebec, Canada, where there's industrial development, roads, pipelines, power lines, truck activity. It generally displaces caribou. There's not that many examples of caribou habituating and successfully living inside of a big industrial area. If there is oil under the coastal plain, the latest USGS description of the potentials is number one, there's no big, large reservoir like Prudhoe Bay under the refuge. Number two, if there's oil at all, it's likely in smaller scattered reservoirs. And in other words, if you're gonna produce a significant amount of oil from this aggregate of reservoirs, it's gonna require a lot of development and infrastructure on the surface that will have profound influences on the visual aesthetics, the habitat, and the wildlife. Profound influences that can never be recovered in our lifetime and way beyond. With the declining number of polar bears, the denning on land is becoming more and more important for them. And then here we come with this added impact. Not possible to do this without significant impacts all the way around. It's environmentally irresponsible to develop a place like the Arctic Refuge. It's a combination of the colonial attitude, the conquering attitude, the frontier attitude, that it will never run out. 2% economic growth isn't enough. They want more. They want 3 or 4% economic growth. The planet is only so big, and the resources on the planet are only so big, and I just feel like it's a crime for us to be pushing things in the direction of more exploitation and more damage to the environment. The Arctic Refuge is a symbol of many things, freedom, wild nature, but it also, this dilemma we're facing right now with the Arctic Refuge, it can function as a turning point to turn away from the precipice, and it could be the catalyst to be part of the turning point that needs to be done on, on a global basis. カナダ北極圏から春の季節移動でずっと長い旅してきて、あの、特に今年雪がすごい深い年だったから、これすごいエネルギーを使い果たすでしょう。長い旅で何百キロ、一千キロぐらいの旅をするカリブだっているわけだ
seems like every time that the situation seemed hopeless, that something always happened to change it. And so I guess that's what gives me hope in this process. And being motivated from that right place, from that hard place. There's a human rights violation in the United States across the board. Now with Trump administration and Republican made it very bad for both of us. We have a right to stand and protect our own way of life as a tribal government. And we're standing our crown and they're afraid of us now. And they're getting weird <laughs> because they, they're not in control anymore. We're coming in. Climate change is real. There is something better beside oil. We're always going to protect the Arctic refuge. We're always going to protect our caribou. And we're always going to be united. We're always going to be no compromise and do it in a good way. When you're on the highest top of Brooks Range and you see the ocean, big body of water, that's sacred, and you see the Yukon flat, to White Mountain, to McKinsey River, to Weissman. That's our traditional ground. That's awesome. To us, we call it Ishikotsan Kwantai Kotlet. That means sacred place where the life begins. Masicho. Thank you. Get me not where the wind blows free. Forget me not by the ICC. Forget me not of a higher power. Forget me not of love within a flower. Forget me not of a past September. Well, this I remember. Just let it be. Just let it be. Forget me not. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for the Explorers Club Polar Film Festival. And I'm delighted to be um, joined for a special Q&A session with filmmakers Kristen Gates and Jeremy Lazell. And they will introduce us to our special guests that are joining us from Alaska. Kristen and Jeremy. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that Love is the Way was filmed on the traditional territories of the Gwich'in, Inupiat, and Lower Tanana Dene peoples. We honor the ancestral and ongoing land and water stewardship and place-based knowledge of the people of these territories. Um, and yeah, we are thrilled to be at the Polar Film Festival. Thank you so much for having us. We have an amazing panel for this evening's Q&A. 
Sikinik, Ryan, Emily, and the Northern Alaska Environmental Center have all worked so hard to protect the Arctic refuge and are a big part of why things are looking more optimistic for the future of this really important place. Jeremy and I were lucky to work with the Northern Center and Ryan on this film, and we hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit more about the Arctic refuge. Um, so why don't we go around now and have everyone introduce themselves. Uh, unfortunately, Bernadette, the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Community, commu Committee, sorry, is under the weather um, and wasn't able to make it this evening. Um, but Sitkinek, would you mind starting us off? Yes, thank you so much for that introduction. Pakalagaf si everyone. Ubanga Sitkinek aningarunga utkiarabigmi. Akala Harriet Mappin, Apala Raymond Mappin, Akaluga Lina Kahakbuk Simmons. Apagasi Abe Simmons Jr. <clears throat> Paniga Sage Lou Willow Sabaktunga Northern Center um, and uh, Sovereign in fact for Living Arctic. So um, welcome everyone. I welcomed and did an introduction in my traditional language um, in Ubaktun and um, introduce myself. My name is Sekanek. I was born in Utyarvik, formerly known as Barrow and um, raised uh, in Fairbanks where I'm calling from, also the um, uh, unceded territory of the lower Tanana Dene peoples. And I have two children, Willow and Sage, and I am the director at Sovereign Inupat for Living Arctic and work also at uh, Northern Center. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and I'll go ahead and pass it on. Um, I see Emily in my, my picture, so. <laughs> Thanks, Sikinik. Hi, I'm Emily Sullivan. I'm the Arctic Program Coordinator for the Northern Alaska Environmental Center. Um, we're thrilled to work on this film with Kristen and Jeremy. I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Dena'ina people. Um, and with that, I'll pass to Ryan. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name's Ryan Marsh. I formerly worked at the Northern Alaska Environmental Center um, during the uh, production of this film and um, was uh, intimately involved with it and um, really grateful to Jeremy and Kristen and everyone else, Sikinik, that worked on the film with us. Um, uh, the Northern Center is the conservation organization um, in northern Alaska and works on conserving public lands um, throughout interior and Arctic Alaska and um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge has been a big focus of their work for decades now um, and uh, this film couldn't have come at a more important time for, for the refuge so um, thank you all uh, so much for having us. Yeah, uh, let's start it off. Uh, Ryan, maybe you could tell us, how did the film come about? You started it off, you were the fearless producer. Maybe you can tell us the origins of, of the <laughs> film. Yeah, um, really it's, the film owes its existence to Don Ross. Um, he uh, was featured in the film as you all saw and he came into, my office at the Northern Center um, a couple years back now, having just returned from Japan, having been gifted uh, the footage of Michio Hoshino on the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge in the 90s when Don uh, had flown with him up there. Um, he was a good friend of Michio's and came back with that footage and wanted to make an advocacy piece for the refuge because of the threat that it is under um, and really was just envisioning a five to seven minute piece using that absolutely incredible caribou, caribou footage. Like you don't get to see that caribou aggregation in the hundreds of thousands that came across the coastal plain um, those days that they were up there is absolutely incredible and really wanted to be able to share that with the world and raise awareness um, for the refuge. And then it wasn't until we reached out to you, Kristen and Jeremy, um, uh, to work on the film that it ended up taking more of uh, 
its current form and being shaped into this feature length production that it was. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Mm. And uh, Sikinik, it looks like the next, there's a question here for you. Um, could you tell us about the Inupiat people and your organization? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, as I said before, I am in about, I was raised in Fairbanks, um, but my traditional homelands are on the Arctic Slope. My grandmother is from the Kukpik Mute people, which um, in a condensed way in the 70s when oil was discovered in Alaska, there was instead of reservations and um, treaties, we had a settlement act um, that gave us 12 corporations. And so um, the Inupiaq people of the North Slope are um, the surface and subsurface rights are controlled by a, a corporation. And that's really, and also um, the largest oil field in North America happened to be on that land. And that's really uh, driven a lot of the journey of Inupiaq people in modern times and a lot of my upbringing as well. And um, with Sovereign Inupiaq for Living Arctic, um, we had myself and two other young um, Inuit um, people and community member um, that wanted to share the information that we'd been learning about a different way to live, a way that we lived for a very, very long time, for over 12,000 years, and um, something that seemed like it wasn't possible, a life without oil. Um, but we saw traveling together at these um, frontline communities, going to conferences, that there was another way, and not just that there was another way, but we have no choice. Uh, we have to transition into an equitable economy that sustains the earth and um, SILA, short for Sovereign Nupak for Living Arctic, um, really represents <clears throat> the um, push to uh, of a younger generation and, and intergenerational, but young, led by young Nupak people um, for a new way of being and being bold and um, organizing and doing this through the Inupak values and also um, organizing from the Hamas principles. And so this film uh, was really special for um, myself to be a part of, you know, this is just in the incorp like the founding of, of Sila and um, my young organizing career. And it was uh, very, very special to see what people have been seeing for a long time um, in the refuge films that were from a long time ago. And then also films from now and people that really care. So um, I hope that answered uh, the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Emily, um, could you tell us more about the Northern Alaska Environmental Center? And now with the new administration, how are things changing? What are your big goals uh, for the future? Sure, yeah. So the Northern Alaska Environmental Center works to promote conservation of the environment and sustainable resource stewardship in interior and Arctic Alaska through education and advocacy. Um, my role at the Northern Center is the Arctic Program Coordinator has really seen a huge shift in the last couple of weeks um, as we welcome the transition of power into the Biden administration. And I can say that um, we have a long road ahead of us as, as Arctic advocates and um, working to protect the refuge, but we're all really breathing a collective sigh of relief right now um, and moving off of four years of a really intense defensive campaign into figuring out how we can actually move into um, seeking permanent protections for the Arctic refuge. And so um, as Many of you probably know when Biden um, took office on day one, he signed an executive order that put a moratorium on all oil leasing activities in the Arctic refuge. Um, we have yet to see exactly how the um, Interior Department will move forward with implementing that and um, challenging the work that's been done so far to open the Arctic refuge coastal plain to oil leasing. Um, but we do have a path forward. We have an administration on our side um, and the road ahead will be a long-term focus on creating uh, a true um, sustainable future for the Arctic. Um, and it'll take, you know, advocating Congress. We need, we need legislation to um, undo that tax act. So there's, there's still a long road ahead, but we're definitely um, shifting into uh, hopefully a brighter future, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thanks. Um, and let's see, this next question might be good for everyone. Um, if, uh, let's see, please describe the coastal plain and why it's so important. I can, I can go <clears throat> first if you'd like. Um, I've actually never stepped foot on the coastal plain and um, it's a place very near and dear to my heart. I've eaten the caribou that's birthed there. I have seen the communities that are fed um, by this, this uh, really sacred place. And um, to see the film itself um, and to, to see this special place that's untouched um, by human activity um, is, it, it reminds me a lot of some of the untouched places in, Western, in the Western Arctic that I'm from. And there's no other way to describe um, being on the land and knowing where your food comes from and, and not just knowing where your food comes from, but for Inupak people and, and Gwich'in, um, although I'm not Gwich'in, I, I know um, we share similar sediments of like, or sediments, yeah, um, of, of that thousands and thousands and thousands of years of eating this sacred food, of ha having this relationship with caribou. And um, when you're able to continue that practice, it's medicine. It's necessary for our mental, physical, spiritual well-being, um, and we also, you know, as said earlier, um, this is uh, the last five percent of the entire Arctic slope that isn't designated for oil and gas. And when we look at the the climate crisis that the SLS administration um, really didn't take serious, uh, and we see that that. The communities of color, the, com the indigenous communities, the communities that are um, lower income are hit first. And when we look at the coastal plain, we can see that we can get back to a place of balance. Um, and for me, it reminds me of where we come from and where we can be again. Thanks, Nick. I might. Um balanced off of that a little bit. Sikhanik spoke so beautifully there to the deep um, cultural, spiritual importance of the coastal plain. Um, part of why we wanted to make this film is that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge has been sort of on the chopping block from the Alaskan government, from the federal, from many federal administrations, um, uh, from some of the most powerful corporations in the world for decades now, and for so many people across uh, this country, you might hear the acronym ANWR, but not have any sort of. Um, understanding of what this place even is. Our representatives in DC would hold up pieces of white paper or point at blank whiteboards and say, this is all that's there. It's just nothing but rock and ice. Why wouldn't we develop it? And we wanted to share both um, this footage uh, through time, um, of how special this place is, but also share um, uh, the, these voices who have these deep, um, incredibly rich relationships with this land um, and, and remind people that this is public land. This is all of our land. This land was set aside in 1960 to not be developed and in, um, 1980, it was expanded the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, but left the coastal plain, which is just a fraction of the whole refuge in limbo. The reason the refuge was created was to protect this intact ecosystem that you can't find anywhere else on earth. I should actually say set of ecosystems from the south, the boreal forest up through the Alpine um, Brooks Range and down onto the coastal plain in the north at the Beaufort Sea and the Arctic Ocean. And the porcupine caribou herd, they migrate across this entire habitat. 
the longest mammalian migration on earth as yet uninterrupted for millennia these caribou have make it, been making this 800,000 mile journey year after year to give birth on the coastal plain. Caribou populations across the Arctic are declining incredibly ra rapidly. We've lost 50% of our caribou in the last two decades. The porcupine caribou herd is one of the only herds that hasn't seen a reduction in that time because it hasn't yet seen development. Its migration route hasn't been interrupted by roads. The Arctic refuge has no trails, no visitor centers, no oil development, no anything except the people and the species that have lived there since time immemorial. And that's what's at stake with the coastal plain, the interruption of all of that to put some oil derricks out there that might lead to the collapse of that entire set of ecosystems. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off so much. But wanted to share how special fantastic Ryan, right, thank you um let's see um yeah are are uh, and to Sikinik, are are there communities up there and, and maybe people within your community who are pro development they see potential revenue a uh, job creation what what would you say to them what's the flip side yeah <clears throat> you know there are many people in my community that believe um, we can drill safely. And there are many people that stand to make millions of dollars, sole income, um, if this drilling continues. And I don't know if they necessarily believe that drilling can be safely done, but that is the, the message that's been sent out by, um, as I kind of uh, alluded to, um, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation that, um, that you know has disempowered many people in the Inupiaq community that do not believe in this. And they do believe that climate change is um, led by, by human activity, that we are contributing to the greenhouse gases, the CO2 rise, the sea level rising. Um, and they, they also have seen um, specifically from my community in Nuxit, um, that my mother lives in, that my grandparents laid to rest in, and that my um, most of my family is is currently living in has had a rise of respiratory illness, 50% since the incorporation of oil. Um, there has been such fast-paced development in the last few years that has been forced upon Nilkset. And although Congressman Don Young and um, representatives like Lisa Murkowski and Dunleavy um, go to DC, go into these public spaces and say that the Inupiaq want drilling. We live in harmony. Yet when you look at simultaneously the Arctic refuge trying to be drilled in, there's also the Western Arctic with the Master Willow project. Um, the overall commenting from the public hearings has been completely against this. And specifically in Nuxet, the whalers, the hunters um, are very, very concerned that they're already limited in their subsistence. We've already had our caribou routes disrupted. Our, um, our caribou are showing signs of starvation, black bone marrow. We have new species coming into our rivers. And, uh, and this type of news isn't, isn't being represented. And it's, it's really um, human right violations and working with the Gwich'in and seeing that we share so much, um, and not just that, but the Inupiaq people, the, the specific, the, the Kukbik mute people, where my grandmother comes from before the establishment of Nuxit. Um, my grandmother lived in skin tents and followed the caribou up to, to Sukbuk Lake and um, lived a nomadic lifestyle that um, shares so many similarities with the Kuchen who use the migration out of the porcupine caribou herd um, where they established all their villages as well. This is uh, well known that we don't hunt only where the caribou are birthed, but where they travel to. And um, it's been like that for since time immemorial. So although I can't speak for the um, Inupiaq nation, I can say that there are many, many of us that see the destruction and the permanent damage that has happened because of oil and gas and that we are not living in harmony. And I'd say that those voices are repressed much of the time. 
And I apologize for being on my phone and you'll see my finger a lot. Uh, I'm pressing the mute button with technology right now. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and let's see, we have a question. Um, what is the status of the refuge today? Well, so we're in an interesting time for the Arctic Refuge. Um, the, the lease sale, um, one of the lease sales that was mandated by the 2017 Tax Act, which is kind of what got us to the point that we have been at and that the film um, explores. So that 2017 Tax Act required two lease sales to take place for the Arctic Refuge Coastal Plain by 2024. One of those has taken place um, and a number of leases were sold. Those leases were finalized before the um, Biden administration took office. And as I mentioned earlier, the Biden administration has placed a temporary moratorium on all refuge leasing activity. So that means at this time, nothing is moving forward towards drilling on the Arctic Refuge, but we have yet to see in detail um, what that will look like as the Interior Department moves forward with um, investigating the previous um, work of the Interior Department in doing environmental assessments, et cetera. So what's going to happen with those leases is still a big question and what we are um, very much still working on. And the, the end goal is to move forward um, with permanent protections for the Arctic Refuge and to find a way that we're not in this um, yo-yo back and forth political battle um, that's been going on for the coastal plain for decades. Um, the, so those in the, um, in the fight to protect the refuge are looking for a really a new forward thinking solution that doesn't put us back in this spot in another four years. There's another one there. Let's see. Oh, sorry, just finding. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a really good question to end on. Um, for those who wish to take action, what steps can be taken now? Um, I just sort of follow up with Emily there. Um, she certainly alluding to where things are at now. A um, couple of things. One, that in the short term, there's still a big threat of seismic testing on the coastal, coastal plain. And the film explored a little bit what this means. It's a separate process from the um, leasing, uh, the lease sales. Um, but it would bring these big thumper trucks and hundreds of uh, staff out traveling across the co coastal plain, a very tight grid, um, sending seismic waves through the ground to um, explore for oil, essentially. Um, and this is really, um, threatening to the polar bear population that lives up there, 900 animals um, in the Beaufort Sea population, endangered species, and these trucks can certainly collapse their dens um, and lead to the deaths of polar bear um, females or their young cubs because it happens during uh, their the fem pregnant females denning season. Um, so that's still on the table and well worth people reaching out to this current administration, the Biden administration, the Interior Department, and telling them um, to focus on um, uh, reviewing the impact, uh, the environmental assessment that was done for that, um, because the last administration rammed it through very quickly, and that's possible to happen this winter. So that's the most immediate threat. As Emily was saying, we're searching for a long-term solution and 
uh, that will rely on Congress. Right now, in 2017, it was Congress that made it the law of the land that oil and gas leasing is one of the purposes of the refuge. Um, it will require Congress to undo that. Um, and so the vast majority of American people uh, don't want to see drilling in the Arctic refuge. We have a split Congress right now. It will be hard to get this through, but with enough pressure from the American people, it's very possible to make this a priority and to change that law. Um, uh, and so writing to your senators especially is probably the number one most significant thing you can do right now. And I'd say the second most significant thing you can do is support the work of those organizing on behalf of the refuge, SELA, um, Sikonix organization, the Gwich'in Steering Committee, um, ourarcticrefuge.org is their webpage, um, and other organizations like the Northern Center and support their organizing work to raise awareness about the refuge. Thank you so much, Ryan. I think uh, that's a good way to conclude. Did anyone want to add anything else? No. I did just want to add one more thing, um, if that's all right. Fantastic. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that the, the um, Koktovik people also are the, the people of Koktovik that are in the Arctic Refuge and um, you know, acknowledging that we live in a system that requires money and we've been put in economic hostage um, situation to get our basic supplies, heat, fuel, food um, to, you know, give up our ways of life or say yes to oil drilling. And um, I hope everyone out there is calling the representatives and uh, also acknowledging that has been done time and time again to rural areas to indigenous people as we saw with the coal industry that's left them um, really with nothing in these towns and so I hope we can create a permanent way to have an equitable um, system that doesn't require this type of situation where you have to pick between family um, or being able to live your traditional life ways so um, thanks so much for this film and then, um, yeah, thank you. I wanna thank all of you so much for being here with us tonight and bringing this really important issue to our attention. And Kristen and Jeremy, thank you so much for your film. It's, it's really wonderful and we look forward to the next one. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. Yeah, and we want to thank the Explorers Club. Thank you, Milbury and Stefan and Sarah. I hope uh, next year we're all back together in person. Um, and yeah, everyone watching, please visit the Gwich'in Steering Committee and the Northern Center and CELA's web pages to learn more and stay up to date. Great. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.